we're, we're all together here. I'm going to give you a little rundown of the way things work, and then we'll get started. Okay. There are, it should, oh, okay. there are uh, four questions which I am going to pose to you as a moderator. So I'm going to say, I'm going to direct this question at Mr. John, and Mr. John, and the question. Mr. John will then answer the question as best as he can. And then it is open to other people. So you may make a comment and say, I agree with Mr. John. You may say, I disagree with Mr. John. Or you may say, can I make a qualified statement of my own? Can I say something myself? You can do any of those things. And each question, each of the four, we're going to have get about 15 minutes, maybe less. I don't know. We'll see how things go. Um, for the first part, after we, um, before we actually get started with the first question, I'm going to ask each of you to just stand and kind of say, this is who I am, this is what I believe, or something like that, something about your life, right, who you are. Okay, once we've done that, I'm going to start with the first question. And the first question I'm directing towards the group. Who's That's me. Oh. <laughs> okay, the first question is going towards the group, so just be ready, you're going to be answering the first one, okay? Okay. All right, so I'm going to start. So uh, please, from, from left to right, if you could please just stand and introduce yourself. Who are you? What do you believe? Okay. Shh. Shh. Okay, uh, I'm Alex Smith. I was born on the 5th June, 1723. And then I died 67 years later, uh, 17th July, 1790. Uh, I spent my life doing many things. I was a lecturer. I was also myself a student at the prestigious Oxford. I became a speaker, a motivational speaker for many people throughout the world. Um, and this speaking position, along with the tutoring position, allowed me to meet very many famous people, including people of power such as um, such as many actors, singers, but um, okay. So my theory position was as a uh, moral philosophist, and now nowadays it's more widely known as psychology. Really, I assess that I would tell people how it works, and I hear too many things for it because yeah, it included in my economic theories. Uh, I was also a traveler, which was why I included. History books nowadays, including the Ivy syllabus for history, if you take the US history. Uh, I'm famous for my economic theories in particular. I was, my theories cited to me as uh, My economic theories allow me to be the title of the other part of economics, and I was the first to suggest that the government should not intervene in the market despite what people were thinking. I started a wave of capitalist, capitalistic people. Many people said that it in it's true, you get my theories. Although it cannot be solidly proven, my master of news today are extremely effective. I also uh, I also came up the idea of absolute trade, which is similar to compared, comparative advantage, where but I do not take into account all factors of production, but only labor, which is why um, other economists have picked up on that and sort of stolen my idea of the only place they to other viewers. Uh, I also thought about why trade is extremely good and about the self interest of people and how it benefits um, everyone. And I'll go to one of the other later and answer the question. All right, thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Shumpi. <coughs> Suddenly to say, 
guidance and part of my responsibility for your employment class. Also, I think that we will try to continue. I'll briefly explain my vision before going into the further detail and other sections of this article. I was also known to retain a highly conservative political attitude, despite the confusion in which the FBI had mistaken me for being for a Nazi. <laughs> which was to be in the Austria's finest person, to be the world's greatest and goddess, and to be the greatest of I'm famous for the term creative description, which is um, a term coined by me to reflect the eradication of existing goods and services to the extent you would have affected this theory, I would also point to that Sean Peter's Okay, thank you, Mr. Sean Peter. Mr. Hayek. Hello, my name is Benjamin Von Hayek, and my birthday falls on the 8th of May, 1899. I'm an economist and a political philosopher. I was noted for my comments of liberal democracy and free market capitalism. Uh, 
story about the relationship between workers and capitalists. The second section explains the relationship between communists and the other workers. The third section addresses looks at various uh, Ethiopian socialist theories and shows how they are different from self-view of socialism. The final section discusses the relationship between the communist bodies and other parties. Marxism uh, developed by me and his parents in the same economic and political philosophy as based on theories of class struggles within societies or community relations or conflicts of interest. My ideas influenced the creation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, in the 1920s and even in the papers of the Republic of China in 1940. Alright, thank you Mr. Marx. Mr. Zhang? I am Mr. Ranjirang Roshan and I am one of the most prolific and acclaimed economists of my generation. I originally studied electrical engineering and went on to pursue postgraduate study in economics. I was one of the youngest to be appointed in many high profile positions in the IMF and numerous other foundations. And I have produced many acclaimed and uh, works that have received numerous awards. My real claim to fame is predicting the global uh, financial crisis. Both. Both the global financial crisis. All right, thank you, Mr. John. Mr. Levitt? Hi, I'm Stephen Levitt. Um, I was born in the United States on 29th of May, 1967. Uh, uh, I studied at St. Paul's Academy in Summit School and graduated from Harvard University in 1989 with my BA in Economics and received my PhD from MIT in 1994. I work as a Distinguished Service Professor and the Director of the Becker Center of Price Theory at the University of Chicago. I am also an honorary professor at McGill University. I must, I'm most well known for my works on social economics, mainly crime. I have researched and written papers on various e economic topics, crime, politics, and sports. I've also made a popular blog with Stephen J. Dubner called Freakonomics.com. Have I mentioned that I also wrote some books called Freakonomics and Super Freakonomics, and you can order them at Freakonomics.com. <laughs> Not so, yes, I have written some books called Free Economics and Super Free Economics, and you can order them at freeconomics.com. <laughs> Alright, thank you, Mr. Levitt. And next we have Mr. Keynes. Mr. Melvin. Greetings, my name is Thomas Robert Malton. 
politics and I'm going to go from you know, an essay on the principle of population. I was born in 1766 and I sadly died in 1804. <laughs> <laughs>
during a recession, the government is meant to inject money into the economy to make sure that income don't keep falling. They do this uh, to inject money into the circular flow of income. As we've seen, government spending is an injection, and if you inject money into the circular flow of income, obviously income is going to rise. Um, but outside of recession, um, the government is required to intervene in economic failure. The government is required to um, use fiscal policy to reach full employment. Once full employment is reached, the government can then step back and allow free market forces to reign free, which is, of course, the most efficient method as shown by Adam Smith's studies. Um, also, once full employment is reached and full free market forces are ready free, um, the government has to advocate competition policy. They cannot allow a monopoly to develop as that is in the shop. All right, thank you, Mr. Keynes. Would anyone like to respond? Yes, sir, John. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry, Mr. Uh, you made a comment saying that uh, obviously injecting money into the circular flow of income uh, would, would increase income, right? So, so yes, sorry, you said. Um, then could, could you just clarify why isn't that happening in the current European crisis where millions and millions of dollars being put as bailout packages in order to stimulate the economy by injecting it into the circular flow of income, but still the European crisis is still happening. Could you respond? Yes, of course. Of course I can respond. You see, the problem with the European crisis is that they are following Keynesian theory word for word. You see some countries applying austerity measures and that is where the European crisis has failed. That is why the European crisis still exists, because of austerity measures, not because of stimulus packages. Uh, can, can oh, me. Thank you, Mr. Keynes. Would anyone like to respond to Mr. Keynes' comment? Mr. Krugman? Okay, thank you, Mr. Krugman. I would like to respond, Mr. Levitt. What, what, what would you say is the government's role in social economies in your country? Well, that's not my expertise in most of the time. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> um, Mr. Hayek. Okay, let's take your injection theory of helping it back to the so let's take the US for example in 2008. They were in a recession and according to the injection, it was basically a bailout to the banks by using taxpayer money. It's because the banks were inefficient that they required these bailouts. I think that they should be liquidated because market forces they need to be efficient, the banks need to be efficient. And this liquidation has to happen. What do you respond to? Mr. Keynes? Well, Keynesian theory doesn't exactly advocate bailing out uncompetitive firms. Yes, we wish to inject money into the economy. Yes, we feel that it would raise incomes and keep employment high. But necessarily bailing out these inefficient firms that were supposed to be too big to fail wasn't actually proper Keynesian theory. All right, thank you, Mr. Keynes. Mr. John? Uh, if you actually know, if you actually read into austerity, um, people that agree with the policy of austerity agree that um, in the short term there will be little or no growth, but in the long run you will get growth. So let's think about this logically. If you don't have any money to spend, i.e., you are in a recession, why would you want to spend more and go even into more debt? Why wouldn't you want to save, i.e., stop spending? Money? You respond? If you had been on my own site, you would understand it. That I also true. Everyone that hasn't been on the site, you just invite. Of course, the paradox of grief is 
self-explanatory really, uh, the thrift and the saving. So if you save, what happens to savings actually is that it falls. If one person saves, they are not spending saving. Um, I like to go to the restaurant every day. And suddenly I say, oh, okay, I think the economy might crash soon. Let's save more money. I don't go to this restaurant anymore. So I save money. So my savings in my hand goes up. But that means that the income of the people at the restaurant that I love to go to will fall. And that will mean their savings will fall. And due to multiplier theory, the overall savings in the economy will fall. In the long run, we're all dead. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Keynes. Um, Mr. Keynes, would you like to respond? Referring back to the recession and your paradox script, actually, the recession of everyone's and causing everyone to say it won't actually happen in 2003. Flip back to the 2008 recession again. Um, according to the recession, it happened because of the housing bubble. <laughs> So you're saying that the government reduced interest rates and came to policy to increase um, employment and from there they borrowed more money to buy more homes and they didn't have the money to pay back. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Once again, this is a Keynesian policy. We wish to direct the economy, not to rule the economy. We just say, go in this direction. It's up to you to make sure that it works. If I had the choice, I would have, if I were the American government, which I'm not, um, I wouldn't have reduced interest rates as much and I wouldn't have encouraged the bubble. True enough, it's impossible to, to predict the bubble, but obviously there are better things than buying houses that you don't need to use. In my perspective, I think the government should instead have invested in more sunrise industries, um, green industries, things that will help the world, not just boost um, capitalism in the, in the bubble, as you said. Uh, just want to confirm what you're saying there. So you're basically saying that um, a way to avoid the 2008 recession was to invest in startup firms. Is that what you're actually saying? That the recession could have been avoided by the loaning to startup firms? No. You just said that investing, say in, okay, investing in startup firms would have avoided the 2008 recession. Again, no, because the two that he was talking about the bubble, to avoid the bubble, we should have invested in other things. To avoid the 2008 recession, the government might not have, should not have um, done too many things at one time. What was the 2008 recession? What's the 2008? The housing bubble was the 2008. Exactly. So again, this is a Cajun policy. <laughs> Yes, of course, they were following Keynesian policy, but not word for word. If they had followed Keynesian policy word for word, they would have stepped back because employment was very high. They would have stepped back and allowed the free market forces to act. They would have allowed competition to raise efficiency. They would have allowed um, price mechanisms to run the economy, but they didn't. Mr. Hyatt? I have an example where a country actually follows your Keynesian theory step by step. Yes. <laughs> they don't. That's the problem. If we did follow it, we would be living in a in a utopian society. <laughs> utopian society? No. The thing is, there is more than just one utopian society. If we had a utopian society in terms of Karl Marx, we would all be equal. We would all work to our potential <laughs> and have <laughs> what, what, what we need. If we were to follow a Keynesian utopia, that would be the complete opposite. Maybe it's very similar to an like Adam Smith utopia, but it would work. So, so you're saying that uh, uh, 
in a utopian society, everyone spends more money than they actually have. No, that's the case. Okay, what, okay, okay, what is what is case in theory? Uh, policy. What is explain to everyone? What is it? I just highlighted that when. Um, okay, just uh, list a bunch of bullet points. <laughs> Government intervenes where necessary, not futile. Okay, thank you, Mr. Haynes. Um, we're going to switch to the next question. The next question is Are people inherently focused on their own self interest? How can we make sure selfless individuals don't create havoc or trample on the rights of others? And I'm going to direct this question to Mr. Levitt. Okay, so, Mr. Levitt, are people inherently focused on their own self interest? How can we make sure selfish, in, selfish individuals don't create havoc or trample on the rights of others? Uh, okay. uh, well, after examining the evolution of experimental economics and the subject of being real economics, we are fundamentally self-interest. People are people and their response to incentive. You could put Mother Teresa in a situation where she might not act altruistically. And you could put Charles Manson, which is a criminal, uh, which is a crime, some, someone who, uh, I don't know what that's mean. But you could put him in a situation where he would have You can't have this. Please stop selfish injury. We can't completely com we can't completely stop selfish individuals from creating social disorder. However, I feel that the best way to prevent this would be for the government to interfere in the free market and impose tougher regulations. Also, law enforcement should be increased to provide for the safety of our society and its sanity. Okay, thank you, Mr. Levitt. Someone like to respond? Someone like to make their own statement? Mr. Smith, you really don't want to say anything about that? Okay. Yeah, um, I spoke before and I said anything negative about it. I would also like to add on that self interest. I would agree that self interest is an extremely good thing. That if, for example, one person had something to trade, another person had something else to trade, if they didn't, if they didn't both agree, because they would, if they both agree on the trade, it would be because of their own self benefit, not because of the benefit of others. So in that case, if it's a win win situation and it supplies to basically every trade. Uh, so I agree that self interest is an extremely good thing, but. I do not agree upon extremely high government interference with it because I, I suppose it promotes competition and if the government interferes way too much then that says this competition and will lead to not be power I suppose if you subsidize in one firm it, the firm will obviously become stronger and be able to produce cheaper goods as competitors and eventually there will be no competition leading to inefficiency and lack of production. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, I agree with what you say about like, there should be not that much intervention, like Mr. Keynes, right? Keynes said it were not, it's, it's only, they should only uh, intervene when it's necessary. But when you said that um, self, self centeredness might be really good, there is a problem with that because it tends to also cause lots of um, like monopolies are sprouted because of this self-centeredness and they tend to exploit other they tend to exploit consumers and other firms this cause a lot of uh, disruption in the economy. Okay, thank you Mr. Levitt. Anyone would like to respond? Mr. Smith? Uh, yes, we do. Do you know Russia is about dictatorship where the leader of Soviet Russia is corrupt 
in and yeah, that the studio fall on so we right. Like I said, men are motivated by their own self-interest. Hence, even though they try to follow your Marxist theory, they still no, we can't can't follow Marxist theory. theory. Exactly. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> that's why you feel So you can't talk about Soviet Russia. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Ms. Marx and Mr. Levitt. Mr. Wright? One more question and Carl wants. Can I ask, how did you actually organize all of your resources according to each person's needs? Through uh, democracy, see what people need and what people want. Well, in, in a consensus society now, it's like Africa, they don't have food either, so like the first society, it's the same problem. Um, Mr. Krugman. Is that, that's why the first period of the work? Like, because we can say, like, um, your theory is um, you based on what they need, and then, like, like you, okay, you read out the medicine, and it's something you see based on the world, right? What if, what if, like, um, they're meeting guys looking at you, based on the majority? What about the minority? Basically, it's not all working, all the people working on the same thing.
you have been influenced by it because I've been widely cited and supported. So, what, what, have you changed your mind overnight? We do. We do support some of the theory about the all. And you talk about America. In America, the top 1%, top earners, earns 21% of the GDP of America. But is it, is it American economy not one of the strongest? As one of the other economists in the room has said that a lot of countries depend on America for trade, for what kind of... How, how, how is that a sign of the economy? Well, well, you just hear about the top earners in America, you don't really hear about the poverty in America. But it doesn't, but does not make companies as a McDonald's and why they need to go worldwide. Still, the poor people have to just only, like, only employ a fraction of people. They're still a big percentage of people living under poverty in right America that they don't really have any chances to. That is true, however. If more, more firms were competitive and they could produce even more, that would lead to even higher employment. And I do agree that the government should intervene in matters such as this through taxation, as Mr. RJ stated. Uh, but your theory suggests that the government should control everything. And does this not take away competition completely? What does that motivate others to work harder than they already do? If they get the same as someone else, but do anything. Competition between firms leads to monopoly power, which leads to the more, more exploitation of workers. <laughs> Mr. Keynes? Competition leads to monopolies. Think about that sentence for a second. Yeah. What is competition? <laughs> what is monopoly? <laughs> like, a firm is really competitive, it leads to monopoly power. But if the firm... Uh, Mr. Hyatt? Doesn't that just mean everyone's competing against each other? Everyone's trying to get an edge, ultimately, ultimately causing an efficient economy? But if a firm becomes very, very, very extremely competitive, like they, they can produce goods at a such a low cost that other firms can't, they'll still, they still have enough to come. Please give an example. McDonald's. Yes, he. Burger King. Burger King, Wendy's. Okay. That's your theory. And doesn't communism promote monopolies in the first place, though? Because everything is coming on. Yeah. And then there'll be one huge firm producing one thing. So let's say you have to produce clothes for everybody. You think, okay, companies of scale, let's have one huge textile firm. Wouldn't that lead to uh, inefficiencies? This economies of scale in the end? No. How did this question from How did I ask for that it turned into us? <laughs> Well, because Mr. Marx got involved. Yeah. <laughs> Would anyone like to respond to the original question, which was, are people inherently focused on their own self-interest, and how can we make sure selfish individuals don't create havoc or trample on the rights of others? Is there anyone that would make it? Okay, uh, Mr. King. Sorry. Well, I uh, agree with Mr. Um, Mr. Smith. Um, I think that the problem is that people are focused on self-interest, but it is self-interest that will and competition that will drive our drive the economy to be more efficient. And also we prevent havoc and individuals trapping on the rights of others through government intervention. When you came from theory like a small amount of government intervention is good. Now, Okay, thank you, Mr. Keynes. Uh, would anyone like to respond to Mr. Keynes or the original question? Okay, in that case, I'm going to move on to. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ricardo, would you like to respond to Yes, I also I agree with the previous assessment made by Mr. Smith. And I've heard something which I defer is that, well, yeah, that, well, I think that. Um,
to question number three, which I'm going to direct towards Mr. Malthus. All right, question number three is where do you think human society is headed over the next 100 years? So Mr. Malthus, what do you think? Where is human society headed over the next 100 years? I think that um, over the next 100 years, the human society will live in a world that is completely based off technology. As all nature would probably have been destroyed by the conglomerates to build what was called builder. Progressive development and innovation would lead to much different situations as compared to the model of the elite economies that are now referred to as modern. As a result, a new technology affecting the factors in which we include part of all our fears. In the next hundred years, who knows? We can reach a token society, though I'm strongly against this at the very of this moment in time. As long as the current state of life, technology hasn't reached a point to which we are able to produce more than was ideally possible. Which is why utopian ideas wouldn't work where we stand now. Reasonably, it's possible, uh, possible for utopian society to flourish in the future if our research and development was to be able to make way for infinite food supplies and other changes in these factors. This would change all our models as all our work when given thought about is based on the economic problem that resources are scarce, which creates arguments for allocation and so on making you talk about idealism and realistic power of the new song. Thank you, Mr. Melfi. So I didn't like your song for that. Mr. Marks? Uh, you said that human population grows dramatically and improves not increases says kind of melting for this point. Why can't chicken, the population of chicken grow dramatically? Okay, about this idea. How it works is that Based on how we are right now, I think not the techno of this is 200 years after the um, How technology stands right now is that we are unable to increase food supplies at will. So it's mainly based on harvest, not animals, because of course those will be human chickens as well. While at the same time, um, humans will reproduce over and over again, this leads to a chain where there will be more people as time passes, but at the same time, food can only be added by stock, by stock. Yes. Alright, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the major flaw in my plan, as compared to this point in time, is that I did not take into account technology as a factor. In population. Okay, <laughs> Uh, would someone like to respond to that? Would someone like to make their own statement? Mr. Levin? Uh, you said that in a hundred years from now, technology would, would rule our lives and we would rely on technology infinitely. Probably. Like, probably. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that by that time, because you said that by that time our resources would be scarce and everything, would you think that by that time the technology would be sufficient to maintain life? Do you not think that we would just break out into an all-out war for resources? No, I, what I said was that right now we sort of scarce. I'm saying that in the future, maybe in 100 years, we will have developed a way in which we can have unlimited resources, maybe. That so you do believe that there will be a way for us to have more resources? I'm saying it's possible. Okay, okay uh, Mr. Levin and Mr. Mathis brought up an interesting point, which spark for me an idea. I think Mr. Schumpeter might want to comment on resources perhaps leading to all of war. That's what you said, Mr. Levin. Mr. Schumpeter, do you have any um, response to what they had just said? Okay. Uh, would anyone like to respond to that or to the previous statements by Malthus and Rudd? Anyone like to make their own statement for where we're headed over the next 100 years? Mr. Rajan? Uh, I guess if we, if we agree to state that self-interest is for the betterment of everyone, then obviously when resources become scarce, acting in our own self-interest, we will have to compete for those resources in a way that is more aggressive than we are now. Uh, and I agree that if we act upon our self-interest, there will be an outright war of getting resources. Okay, thank you, Mr. John. Yeah. Would you like to respond to that? Uh, Make a response of your own? 
that only took 10 dollars worth of electricity per hour, would that not reduce production costs and eventually be back in price? Use production costs if we use machines. If we use machines and it uses, perhaps this is in the long run, where electric would cost $10 an hour, wash that would cost $50 an hour. So would that $40, would that $40 reflect the new price? Yeah. 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 Let's, let's simplify that. Supposing a, a robot can do our jobs at a cheaper, uh, at a cheaper rate. So wages are now more expensive than these robots. And as you said, okay, startup costs might be very expensive. But once that startup cost is covered, wouldn't prices drop exponentially? Yeah. Exponentially. And then wouldn't that reflect in prices when
So I guess that would stay the way it is. Thank you, Mr. Ricardo. Mr. Smith? You stated that I get that. You questioned how you can have sustainable, uh, sustainable growth in the community by using a factory source of variance. Why not use it? Why not use the comparative advantage or absolute advantage and use that data resources more, more clever? Like, if a country has an advantage to create something, why not use them to produce it so you use some best resources in other countries? But we not in all countries if we have this and we can trade with each other. We do not have all resources theoretically in the, in the least in the possible to use to produce them. Does that understand what you're saying? <laughs> uh, it, you know, so if all countries just follow this and produce what they were good at producing and trade it with each other, would they not be using, would they not be producing these goods in the least possible input available? So there would be a possible way to sustain what you want to do Yeah, but it's not, it's not a, a realistic point of view that all countries are going to trade with each other. It's a, uh, it's a utopian society where all countries are happy and can trade with each other, but that's not the case. So, and it, yeah, yeah, as uh, my other part says, <laughs> due to self-interest, why would we want to trade with other countries if there are like political uh, situations? It's not like, realistic. It's not going to happen in the, in the generation to come. Mr. Krugman, did you want to make a statement about comparative advantage yeah, in the trade? I think um, at the same time, we need to like, and we can also like develop
we mined it, there will be excess weight. So we're just destroying the ore. Yeah. Okay. Will the uh, market system be much better at allocating uh, resources according to the map than the government system? In your theory of communism, you would say that the government should allocate all the resources in the market system. In other words, the manager is produced. No. In the According to our marks, for each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Well, if you look at the example of the Soviet Russia, you're looking at like consumer goods will almost never produce for long stretches of time from the government who is investing more and more in industry and in agriculture. You would see excess produce of what was needed and still consumers like what they really needed. It's not Marx's. It's not Marx's. Alright, Mr. Rajan, Mr. Marx, thank you. Um, I think that discussion by itself could go on forever. <laughs> Is that, does anyone want to make some sort of final statement? Something is burning, you have to say it. <laughs> Mr. Malthus. Capitalism <laughs> rules. You all run, you're all dead, so let's just forget it. And now stare into the way. Have your also spot while you're dead. dead. <laughs> coming today was a very good conference. Uh, with your pictures, please leave those on the desk. Can we leave the desk as they are the next class?